I am so thrilled to welcome um, Dr. Schiffler from the Office of Naval Research. He'll be sharing his experience, which is over 40 years in science and technology, specifically in materials science. Um, he has worked with faculty and scientists from around the world on um, things such as high temperature propulsion materials um, for um, both aero and shipboard gas turbine engines and cellular materials. And I am um, thrilled to share with you, he has, uh, he has authored books, edited books, and um, high-impact journal articles. He, he is an expert, and he is sharing his presentation with us. His slides have been posted to Canvas. And um, one of the questions of today's quiz has been uh, provided by Dr. Schiffler. So it's going to be fantastic. I hope you all lean into today's conversation and um, well, that's that's just about it. Help. Thank you, and welcome, Dr. Schulzer. Uh, so I'll talk about uh, research in my in my funding agency at the Office of Naval Research. Um, o and R is celebrating its 75th anniversary uh, this year. It was uh, founded in 1946 to foster and encourage scientific research. This was the result of all the research that allowed us to, uh, you know, develop uh, materials and. Uh, weapons during World War II to actually enable us to, uh, you know, come out on top during that war. And in 2001, uh, rather than doing strictly fundamental research, it, we now added applied research and, and demonstration programs in 2001 so we could foster transition of the science and technology to actually uh, materials and, and components and, and products for the warfighter. Uh, just a couple of definitions and budget activity. Uh, we, we, unlike our Air Force and Army uh, uh, colleagues, we fund 61, 62, 63, and a little bit of 64 uh, programs. Uh, universities and uh, are usually funded through uh, 61 and 62 programs. I, uh, I do not know of any uh, 63 programs where, where universities are directly funded. Uh, they may get funding from a uh, you know, a contractor as when they operate as a subcontractor. So this is the definitions that, that we operate under. And this is our portfolio that we have a $2.5 billion and it covers the activities of ONR headquarters, which is in Arlington, Virginia, uh, the Naval Research Laboratory in Washington, DC, ONR Global, which is uh, actually really global. We have uh, offices in San Diego, Chile, uh, Sao Paulo, Brazil, Prague, Czech Republic, uh, London, UK, Tokyo, Japan, uh, Singapore, and Melbourne, Australia. And I'm sure I've missed one. But uh, nevertheless, we are worldwide, and that's where we engage foreign uh, researchers in our programs uh, and uh, through, the, through the Office of Naval Research Global. And then we have PMR. Uh, 51, which is a reserve unit uh, within ONR. Uh, we are largely a civilian organization, but we are headed by Ab a Real Admiral Lawrence Selby. He's the Chief of Naval Research, or CNR, and our Vice Chief of Naval Research is Brigadier General Benjamin Watson of the U.S. Marine Corps. But you can see that we're broken down to, you know, a lot of support staff, but also five technical um, de uh, departments, which I'll give you a very brief summary of in the next couple of slides. But before we do that, you know, do you want to be a part of the research program? We're looking at fundamental research and, and applied research, primary for university. But uh, I always have a vision of where is that research going to go? If we have success and, and, and discovery of of, of things that I, that I sponsor in basic research, I used to have a vision of where I actually want that to go down the road, uh, unlike, again, my Air Force and uh, Air Army com compatriots. So if you're interested in that, you can uh, check this website, and uh, I highly recommend that if you have an interest in one of these subjects, that you uh, contact the appropriate ONR program officer. So in our first um, department is CAR, oh, we, uh, Code 31 and 8, support research in mathematics, electronic, computer, 
information scientists, applications and com command and control, communications, cyber intelligence, uh, electronic warfare, intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance. That's a mouthful. But, uh, and I have selected just a few of the s and programs that they sponsor. Again, if you want to see more, the, they're on the website under their department. Um, Code 32 is, since we operate in the ocean largely, we need to understand how the ocean behaves. And so we look at ocean ac acoustics, we look at marine mammals and biology, we look at sensing within the ocean, and we try to understand the ocean itself, and oce oceanography and the like. So again, these are some of the select science and technology programs supported by that department. Uh, Code 33, it develops technology to enable uh, superior war fighting and energy capabilities for naval forces, platforms, and undersea weaponry. And uh, we look at naval engineering and power and energy. How can we sustain ourselves um, independently of uh, fuel, for instance? Uh, do we have batteries and energy storage and uh, fuel cells and the like? Uh, so, and we also have materials uh, in our in our department, this is my department, and uh, you know, additive manufacturing and various material uh, issues uh, abound in this in this department. Uh, Code thirty four is our warfighter performance department, and we un, un, you want to enhance warfighter effectiveness by understanding how they they operate under stress in you know in a given situation, whether it be in peacetime or in, in, in matters of conflict. And so by understanding how we respond, we try to develop uh, and, uh, systems that can assist in them being more effective in their, in their missions. And lastly, it, uh, Code 35, it's our uh, air warfare and weapons uh, department and fosters technology. Uh, in development of naval aviation platforms, kinetic energies, directed energy, and electric uh, weapons. And again, these are select uh, programs that are sponsored within this department. And if you want to see more, you could go to that website and it'll list far more than what I show here. Uh, one of the things I like to highlight is power propulsion, thermal management, and the science of autonomy. So I, I'm going to go into my division uh, specifically, and we look at the high performance of functional and structural materials. We also look at environmental quality because as ships run through the ocean, they develop uh, slime and encrustations on, on the surfaces of their hulls, and that actually reduces efficiency so that we are using more fuel to, to transverse the same distance. And so we look at anti-fouling and foul release coatings to try to minimize that buildup of uh, materials on the ship hull. We also uh, optimize uh, materials by either computer design or uh, and also look at solid mechanics and, and how do we evaluate these materials non-destructively and how can we pr predict what the life of these materials are uh, in this thing. And, and we have adopted, particularly in my, my division, uh, integrated computation materials, engineering, and science to try to accelerate materials discovery and development. And these are some of the programs. I'll, again, highlight these very briefly. Um, but uh, again, I talked about marine biofouling. Uh, we're trying to protect the environment. We're also not trying to kill the, the uh, life in, in that. We used to use organa tin and copper additives to our paints, and that appeared to damage the sea life, um, even uh, you know plankton type uh, sea life. And so we have tried to develop very benign uh, fouling release coatings, sort of like Teflon, if you will, um, to um, prevent uh, buildup of incrustations and keep the ship clean of, the, of those so that it can operate more efficiently uh, as it's transversing in the ocean. Uh, corrosion control and mitigation. Um, we are looking at uh, $6 billion of, of degradation per year. 
uh, as a result of corrosion. And so we are always trying to understand how these materials behave, uh, whether it be uh, metallic or ceramic or polymeric materials um, or composites. Um, we try to understand the science uh, of the corrosion activity in a marine environment, whether it be uh, atmospheric or um, actual water immersion or, or intermittent water immersion. And, and by understanding that, then we can try to develop mitigation strategies to preserve these materials much longer than they are being preserved today. We're also looking at uh, photovoltaics, uh, organic uh, or photovoltaics are lightweight. And so we're trying to minimize weight because we could have a war fire carrying this around with them. And they carry like 100 pounds as it is. So we can reduce that to 80 pounds. That, that uh, helps them in you know, carrying this material farther and farther uh, in their mission on, on a daily basis. And so we're trying to understand the science of these organic photovoltaics to uh, afford us, you know, uh, efficiency and gains in, uh, the, in the power outlet. Uh, fuel cells uh, and, and batteries, uh, again, the same thing. We're trying to uh, determine the mechanisms at high temperatures. Uh, Solid-like -like fuel cells operate at you know, 800 degrees, and uh, we like to lower that uh, temperature to much lower temperatures so that we use more uh, and, and less exotic materials. And, you know, so, uh, you know, we developed lithium ion batteries many years ago. We're now looking at nickel zinc uh, batteries as, again, another way of increasing uh, power density you know, because, again, we operate near and far from the ocean and uh, we want uh, our war fires to be independent of uh, supply chains. Polymer matrix composites, we're always trying to go to higher and higher temperatures. Uh, they're uh, at, currently at about 625 centigrade and we like to raise that temperature another 100 degrees if, if at all possible. So how can we do that? How, how can we design materials to, to exist in that? Because they have uh, you know, weight savings uh, over uh, metallic materials. And uh, how do we make them more stable at these higher temperatures and in the marine environment on top of that? Solid mechanics. So how do our materials, whether the metallic, composite, ceramics, or, um, or the like, how they respond to um, uh, shock and blast. You can see in the upper right hand corner, you know, a blast near a ship. How does that behave? And can we prevent damage like the USS Cole that happened in 2000 where a big hole was, was uh, for, because of small explosives uh, in a, a boat that came close to the, uh, to the ship? You know, how can we prevent you know, developing a big hole and almost sinking that ship. So we developed sandwich structures and and, and modeled uh, its its response to things like that, and we can now prevent that. And so uh, that's that's the crux of this uh, program is to find more resistant materials and structures. Computer aided materials design. <coughs> Excuse me. You know, if you're looking at material space, whether it be, uh, you know, compounds or uh, high entropy alloys and the like, we have a huge a number of possibilities. And here it says 10 to the 120th power uh, possibilities. So how can we down select to that more quickly and computational methods or allow us one avenue to, re to do so in, in an efficient manner so that we can down select and then do uh, more um, uh, exotic tests uh, and actually try to do high throughput testing uh, to uh, determine what candidates uh, can move forward so that we can develop products using that material structure. So uh, it is uh, highly important and it's allowed us to uh, develop materials much more quickly uh, and, and also develop a, more, a greater diversity of materials over time.
nanomaterials have been around for many years, but we still need to understand how they behave in, in the different uh, environments that we operate in. Uh, we can do low temperature uh, and, uh, and high temperature materials and how to do they, are, are they stable in, in each of those environments? Uh, what are the properties of that? And how can we fabricate materials that are more resistant to uh, uh, brain growth uh, if they're existing in either a high temperature or a low temperature environment? So that is the crux of this, uh, this program. Structural metals, uh, we operate with iron, aluminum, and titanium as our principal structural alloys and we need to know how we can fabricate them more efficiently. Titanium is a very high cost item, uh, largely to, uh, due to the uh, development of the pure titanium from uh, all its sources and how can we actually reduce that cost so that it could be more uh, universally used because it's highly resistant to uh, seawater and uh, it could save us money in the long run if we can reduce its actual cost. So, um, and it's also, uh, you know, less dense than steel. So uh, we've been working on that for many years and it's actually one of the naval requ uh, uh, requirements uh, that we do so uh, because not many places uh, use steel nowadays. Uh, propulsion materials. Um, um, we are trying to develop materials that uh, actually are counter to intuitively. Uh, we're trying to go to higher temperature materials but also make them last longer. And so uh, uh, we are trying to look at um, some of the corrosion activities that have actually developed because we go into higher and higher temperatures uh, such as uh, CMATS which stands for calcium, magnesium, and aluminum silicate or basically sand. Uh, and you find that uh, if that melts it actually affects both um, chemically and mechanically uh, some of the materials that we use in high temperature applications in, in our engines. And so um, we're trying to understand those mechanisms, try to develop new materials that are resistant to those mechanisms. And, and as we go to higher temperature, we find more mechanisms. So it's a never ending job. You know, currently we're trying to look at 1500 degrees C or above. And the I, I list the um, the different materials that we're currently looking at, including uh, high entropy alloys. We're also looking at materials for hypersonics. If we're going to Mach 5, uh, 6, 7, 8, uh, we have a lot of frictional uh, uh, shear forces that actually raise the temperature, particularly if you have some uh, moderate uh, atmosphere that you're you know, resisting as you, you go through this through, uh, through your trajectory. And so uh, we need to develop ultra high temperature materials or uh, whether it's uh, ceramics or high temperature alloys uh, to resist that. And uh, we need to understand those properties so that we can design structures uh, efficiently so they can actually be re reused if, if possible. Uh, metamaterials are used primarily for electromagnetic and optical phenomena um, and uh, we are trying to understand how they can develop different structures to, to obtain the, the meta material uh, phenomena and uh, so we're looking at that to develop you know, you know uh, radar and an antenna uh, for our communication system um, so there is some a measure of protection from uh, electromagnetic uh, frequencies. If we develop these shares, we need to understand how they degrade over time and we need to develop non-destructive methods uh, because we don't want to take a component out of service and so if we can do things non-destructively as you can see in the aircraft below we can do that non-destructively uh, or even have you know readback system incorporated in the aircraft or the com or the uh, component that uh, we're trying to observe, um, then we can we can predict or help predict when this material needs to be replaced. Rather, you know, on a time basis, we look at a condition based uh, condition 
where it needs to be replaced or else we can have failure. Because we want to protect the aircraft, but most importantly, we want to protect the uh, operator, the pilot, if, 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 in, in case of an aircraft. So that's things that we have to look at. And then lastly, uh, the ones I want to talk about is additive uh, manufacturing materials and process. Um, it has a great um, benefit if we can do it right. Um, you know, we can, rather than having a huge supply chain of thing, you know, uh, components on the shelf, uh, we can, if we have a digital um, copy of the component, we can make it. But if we make it, we can, make, it can, we can make it so it looks like the old component, but we need to also make it so that it has the properties of that old component. Um, otherwise, and, and some of those components are mission critical or flight critical. So if they fail, we lose an aircraft or we lose you know, uh, an asset. So we have, to, we have to do it right. And so we have to look at the research, look at the heating and cooling profiles of each uh, AM method and, and how can we uh, build these materials properly so we can avoid the flaws that can be inherent in such activity how can we minimize that and how can we make it so that it's similar to raw uh, materials so I've given you a very quick overview of some of the programs that we have within o &R. Uh, so if you're interested, how do you start to engage with ONR? Well, the, the main address is www.onr.navy.mil. So if you look at that, you'll see that. And it has, a, at the very top, it has a number of things you can look at. But if you want to look at funding announcements, that's the address for funding. That, and we have a broad agency announcement uh, every, uh, all the time that is, covers every fiscal year. In FY21, you can see what the long-range uh, BAA is, and that will be updated probably in late September, maybe sometimes early October, for FY22, which begins on October 1st. It's the primary announcement for our core research uh, programs, the 6162 program. As I say, it's open throughout the year, and you can use that to find the appropriate program officer as well. Right? The, uh, Email addresses for all the program office within ONR are just listed on that ONR website. And uh, my suggestion is you, you work with them, you know, contact the program officer that you're interested in working with, and they probably will suggest, I know I will always suggest a white paper because uh, I, I don't want to see a proposal. It takes too much of your time, too much of your university's time, and it takes my time. Uh, to, to read a proposal. And, and I would like to see you know, a capsule summary of what you're proposing with, a, with an associated cost uh, you know, with that. But uh, before I move to the next slide, there's also other BAAs uh, with unique programs uh, that are announced on our website, such as MURI's uh, Multi-University Research Initiatives, DORPS, which is equipment for universities, uh, Young Investigator Programs, uh, the, the uh, qualifications change every year, but the most recent qualification is uh, that uh, you have to be within five years of your PhD uh, to qualify. And then there's other special topics that come up from time to time. Um, I'd like to emphasize that DAD is uh, as spending profiles and so associated with R&D and funding. Again, our fiscal year begins October 1. And that would begin with or without funding, because oftentimes we have continued resolutions, so we don't have a budget on October 1 with, on those years. Um, yeah, this is the way they like to have things spent. Uh, we, we, are, we are, are pushed to have, offer 70% of our funding uh, for awards by December 31st in the first three months of the fiscal year. And by the end of the year, uh, we, have, we need to have 100% committed 95% awarded, and 50 or 6 of the money we sent out that fiscal year actually spent and billed back to ONU. Our grants are typically three and four years. They, you know, used to be single 
uh, investigators. Um, we are now starting this year for me. Uh, we're now looking at, um, at projects which uh, incorporate, uh, say, a, a number of uh, team, a number of members forming a team to look at a single problem for a number of years, three or four years, maybe five. And uh, one thing I like to emphasize, uh, there are times, because I have commitments uh, each and every year, there may be times, like for instance, in my case, uh, um, I may have a year where I can't have any new starts because I'm already com over, uh, committed to the continuum uh, obligations I already have. So. Um, Again, it's best to start at the white paper stage and then you can find out if I do have funding or any other program that has funding for that given fiscal year. So again, do you want to be a part of the defense research program? It is open uh, through ONR Global to people overseas. And then uh, ONR headquarters in Arlington uh, work on funding people around the United States uh, directly. Uh, I also fund overseas projects, but I, I share a cross share with ONR Global. Um, you know, so what is your area of uh, potential research? Um, and again, I would recommend you you talk to uh, the appropriate ONR program officer, find out what they're interested in. Uh, you can provide you know a, a brief summary of your 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 ideas. Uh, if you write. A white paper, I suggest two to five pages, not 70 pages like I see once in a while where, you know, it's three pages of uh, what they want to do and 60 pages of their uh, CV. Um, I, I don't need that. Uh, and no other program office is interested in that either at that, at that time. Um, so, you know, white paper will engage our interest and we'll let you know. And if it's accepted, then that's when you want to write a proposal. If you write a proposal, I suggest this website as uh, as the foundation for writing a proposal because ONR has gotten more bureaucratic in recent years, and you need to follow all the uh, uh, cross all the T's and dot all the I's uh, to get a successful proposal through. Uh, and 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 I have to evaluate it, and then our grants people. Uh, if, if you don't fill things out, so ask for it, and that just delays your award. So um, just follow the directions on that on that website, and you, you'll do well. Uh, and all grants get submitted through grants.gov at this point in time. So I think I have, I'm ready for questions. Yes. Um, I'm not seeing any questions currently in the chat, but we'll give them a couple of minutes to digest. Yes. Question about uh, $6 million in degradation. Um, what is it that we're looking at degradation on to come up with that $6 million figure? Oh, okay. Well, I say we have, uh, we have corrosion aqueous solutions, so that's uh, a result of chloride induced uh, corrosion pitting. Uh, we can have uh, de-alloying, we can have uh, fatigue, uh, cracks, uh, stress corrosion crackings. It depends on the uh, specific environment application. Uh, in high temperature, what, which is where I work in, uh, we have what is called hot corrosion where uh, sulfide-related uh, or sulfate-related uh, salts uh, degrade and inter interfere with the protective coating of uh, either a, a protective coating or the alloy itself to cause uh, you know, loss of that material. Uh, you, know, you can also have creep in, involved with it, and that's why we're trying to go towards more single crystals because they are more resistant to creep. Um, and then you have atmospheric corrosion where you have uh, wet and dry cycles, and that is very um, damaging to a number of materials. And so uh, whether it's coatings or, uh, or you know, again, metallic alloys uh, alone. Uh, so, uh, and, and then we have crevices on aircraft. There's a lot of crevice corrosion on aircraft because there's a lot of seams, uh, and, you know, rivet seams uh, all through the aircraft. And then you have galvanic corrosion, you know, if we have uh, 
let's say carbon fibers in contact with metals, the carbon fiber will induce corrosion of the metallic portion. And so that's not a good thing because the metallic portion wears away and then you have, uh, you know, loss of a rivet or you can have, you know, it could be catastrophic if it's a, a you know, part of a wing or something like that. Um, I do have another question. Um, if someone is submitting a proposal, can they submit the same or a similar project to the Office of Naval Research and to NSF? Um, one of the quite one of the questionnaires that I've read when I'm looking at proposals is, have you submitted this to another organization? So, and you have to answer truthfully whether you have or not. So, uh, just be aware of that. Now, you can tweak it so that you're looking at a different, a slightly different phenomena, and I think that's that's okay. But you can't send the same proposal to two different organizations. Because you know, you run the risk of getting run the risk of getting funded by both organizations, and that's in a, in a, probably in, a, in the eyesight of both the organizations. That's not fair to other people that didn't get an award. So then, is summer the best time to engage submit a white paper if the fiscal year starts on October first? I would say uh, any time in July and August would be a good time. I'm, I've been uh, asking for white papers from one organization uh, all through June. I haven't seen them yet, but uh, you know, uh, cause we're going to evaluate this by, uh, in my department, we, I am the one that evaluates white papers. Uh, in other departments, uh, they do something similar to the Air Force, where they have a team of people evaluating proposals. And that takes more time because everyone had seems to be busy, and it's a matter of time to get comments back. You know, when you have a, a, a team of people evaluating white papers, uh, I say within my department, I'm the sole judge on whether things get funded or not. Um, and then I I later get evaluated um, by a, a, a peer group periodically every t you know two or three years to see if I'm, I'm doing a good job in evaluating, you know, proposals and, and funding the right programs. And what is the range of funding for a single investigator for a three to four year award? All right, well, I'll go by year, uh, you know, funding for by uh, on a yearly basis. Excuse me. I have three phones in this office. Some is my personal. Um, so um, I fund. I don't try to fund anyone for less than 100k because uh, you know costs and, and overhead is just eats a lot of a lot of the dollars for research up. Uh, so 100k is probably my low figure. Um, and uh, the thing I try to do is try to get as many programs as possible with the, the dollars I have. So right now my current limit is 150k. Uh, for uh, you know research grant, um, other program officers may provide more, depending on you know uh, what their funding uh, profile is in total, and how many programs they want to actually uh, follow. So, so I, I will say it, it might go up uh, to uh, I'll say 200k. I'll just use a round figure uh, per year, and I say for three or four years. What are the most common mistakes that you find in proposals? Give any tips to avoid. Uh, proposals. Well, um, I'll I'll say I'll, I'll I'll put it this way: people I tend to fund, I have I have I have uh, listened to at different conferences. I like I like to go to conferences to look at new people and see how they are see how they're accepted by the community uh, that they're, you know, they're talking to. That, that's how I like to do things. I, that doesn't say I don't do any, uh, you know, a funding of, of uh, say, cold calls, per se. Uh, but that's the way I like to operate. Um, as to, uh, well, one of the things I have found is, you know, someone will propose um, a six-year program and a three-year grant. 
And, uh, you know, I, I just, I mean, I, I'd like to see that done in three years, but on the other hand, I don't think it's realistic uh, given the uh, time constraints and the funding constraints that, that you have. So I say, uh, the gen if, I, if I see anything in error, I think that's, um, that's one thing. Now, there are some times that um, I've seen proposals that are technically wrong and, and you know, if they're technically wrong, then they don't go very far, particularly in the white paper stage. You know, that's why I like white papers. I can, I can choose very quickly whether I'm, I even want to consider funding them in the white paper stage based on what they, how they write. Uh, and I think any, any professor with their soft should be able to write concisely uh, to get their point across. I mean, it's, once in a while I ask questions, I'll call them up and say, you know, what do you mean by this? But, you know, I'm just saying broadly, they, sh they should be able to get their point across in, in two to five pages so pretty easily. And, and give me like a half page of their CV. Uh, it, it's, it's all I'm looking for at, at that time. Okay, that makes sense. And then we'll have one final question for you, Dr. Schiffler. Could you elaborate on the URIP program? The what now? URIP right, program. Oh, the door. Okay, um, we fund uh, particular people that are, we are funding. Uh, you know, my PIs can send in a proposal saying they need this piece of equipment to more uh, appropriate, you know, perform their research. You know, you know, for me, that's that's you know, that's what I typically see. Now, there are times where I have a I have a university that I'm not funding. And uh, and I you know they just come out off, the, off you know it's a it's actually a cold call and um, and that doesn't tend to get funded just because if I don't if I'm not funding something along those lines why should I support that over some of some PI that I'm supporting and that's supporting the Navy um, so uh, but it's for you know you know. You know, let's say an XPS or um, uh, let's say a burner rig or, or or some piece of equipment that will help them do their research more efficiently uh, towards the research program that I'm supporting, uh, typically. And so the the cross range is they so they say is fifty thousand to a million. Um, I don't see too many over six hundred thousand. Uh, the the mindset most recently within ONR is we try to fund as many DORPs as we can rather than um, go to big ticket items that you know eat up a lot of uh, money and lessen the number of awards that we we offer. I mean it, it does happen but I say I don't see many of them over 600,000. The typical um, equipment uh, request is now within two to three hundred thousand. Uh, it's, it's the most common uh, price range. Thank you so much. And then just really briefly, um, is your office next to Boeing Air Force Base in DC? No, they're across the river. Uh, uh, Naval Research Laboratory uh, is um, in Washington, on the outskirts of Washington, DC. That's where Boeing Air Force Base. Now, the uh, Air Force Office of Scientific Research is co located in our building. Uh, we we have the majority of the floors. Uh, uh, we have um, we actually have 13 floors, but they skip 13 and, and go from 12 to 14. I don't. Someone's superstitious. Um, but uh, and the Air Force op uh, uh, operates in floors three and four, um, and we we pretty much have the rest of the building. Thank you so much.